Thank you, Pastor Jonathan. Y'all should be. Glad to see everybody this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so happy to see y'all. I think um, some of y'all I have the opportunity to meet. My name is Carrie. Um, if I haven't got the chance to meet you yet, I look forward to meeting you after service. Um, and then I look forward to actually seeing y'all again this evening. Right? I want to eat dinner with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to love you just like Jesus has loved me, as he says in 1 John 4.10. He says this is real love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and was a sacrifice for our sins. I want you to love me like that, too. So see y'all 4.30. All right? Now, like Jonathan said, uh, we're talking about discipleship. 2013, go back with me there. That was one of my first like, like meetings with discipleship. I'm at a church in West Palm Beach, Florida. It's about a thousand person church. And uh, I'm talking to someone who I knew casually. And I, for whatever reason, out of my mouth spews out, I got this sin struggle. And as it came out, I was shocked. I was like, we barely know each other. Why did I just say that? Where's this conversation going to go? No idea, right? Well, he responds. He looks at me dead in the eye. He says, listen, I've been through that. And I got a system, and I can help you. So I hear that. I'm like, what system? You know, I'm thinking that in my head. Uh, how long is this going to take for him to help me? How vulnerable do I got to get? For him to help me. That one scared me to death. And then I'm thinking about it. I'm like, man, I felt shame getting those words out of my mouth. What's it going to look like when we start like really digging in? If I feel this amount of shame now, what, what will it look like when he sees like the midpoint of what's going on and then the depths? So all that's running in my mind in like 10 seconds. So I tell him, I tell him, before I get to that, sorry, I want to say this one thing I forgot to mention. I have a war going on inside. See, the spirit in me, right, the spirit of God's working, and the spirit saying, yes, yes for the glory of God. Get rid of that sin. Pursue Jesus. Flesh, though, is saying, no, stay where you're at. See, like sin, it's like comfortable, um, it's, it's, uh, it can feel like kind of sweet. So I answer to him, I say, no. I, I, I actually got a couple friends that I'm, I'm dealing with and they're helping me, so I'm good. That's 2013. Fast forward, it took to 2017 till I started to see the Lord working and shaping my life. And he did it through discipleship, actually through my music pastor. And then just more help from other saints. So the thing is, discipleship's important, right? Now, in Christianity, there is no such thing as you're going to figure it out on your own. There is no such thing as you got it together, right? We need help. Yes. And Jesus offers us that through <laughs> discipleship. So let me pray, and then we will continue on answering this first question. What is discipleship? Lord, I pray that you show us discipleship, um, how you say your road is narrow, but your burden is light. Pray that you help us um, see your grace, a powerful picture of your grace, a powerful picture of your mercy. Um, and Lord, how you invite us um, in such a sweet, 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 sweet way. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start with what is discipleship? <clears throat> discipleship, we'll start by explaining what a disciple is. A disciple is, as far as Christianity is concerned, is someone who's been recruited, hand-selected to follow Jesus. And I have this definition up. This is a technical definition from a book written by uh, Mark Dever on 
on discipleship. It's a person who is captivated by Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for them on the cross, so much so that they reorient their whole lives toward him and his mission. So discipleship implies two things. One, you want to become like Jesus more in your thoughts, attitudes, and actions. But simultaneously, it also implies that you want to tell others about Jesus because you're in love with him and help them see the beauty of Jesus and adore him. So the natural question is, how come you've been recruited? If you're sitting in this room and you're a Christian, how'd you get recruited? How'd you get hand selected, right? Well, here's the process. The process is, first, we have done wrong against ourselves, against others, and more importantly, against God. On top of that, we thought we were going down the right path. With that said, the times where you, you're seeking self-gratification, the times where you're pursuing self-preservation above others, the times where we idolize something so much so and we know it's wrong, but we can't help ourselves, that's going trying to go down the right way. And God sees that as sin. And with God, the penalty for sin is death. But in the midst of us walking our own way and thinking it was right, God meets us. He interrupts all of that. And he hand selects us for the Lord's army. The Lord's army. How does he do that? Well, Jesus came and he lived a perfect life so that he can die and be the perfect sacrifice. And so all that repent of their sins and believe in him as Lord, you will experience a right standing relationship with God. Meaning God looks at you and he no longer will condemn you for your sin. He looks at you and says, you are my child based on the work of my son. So if you haven't done that, you can be in the Lord's heart. It's that simple. You repent of your sins, you believe. But then there's some of you that you've already done that. So here it is. We got to we got to put our bootstraps, tighten them up because we're in the Lord's army. So then what is discipleship? I like how Mark Dever puts it in the book. He says it's helping others follow Jesus. Um, more specifically, it's initiating a relationship in which you teach, correct, model Jesus in order to help someone or people adore and be like Jesus. Jesus invites us into a relationship to be like him through discipleship. Let's look at this first picture of it because we're actually going to follow a scene of Peter, a bit of Peter's life to see how Jesus pursues us towards discipleship. So this is John chapter 1, verse 35 to 42. It says... The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said, What are you seeking? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard Jesus speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So in that, that scene that we see here, you have John the Baptist. He was a popular uh, prophet of his time. Same time that Jesus is, is about to uh, make his ministry public. So John has some disciples with him. And John sees Jesus walking early morning. He says, hey, behold, the Lamb of God, the one who comes to take away the sins of the world. And two of the disciples, they're like, 
hey man, I gotta go. So they leave, one of them is Andrew, he's like, hey, he spends time with Jesus, this is like early morning, and then he spends time with Jesus till about 4 or 5 p.m., and he's convinced, so he goes, Andrew, he finds his brother Simon, and he says to Simon, hey, we have found the Messiah. And then he tells his brother Simon, hey, come with me, we need to see Jesus. Jesus sees Simon, and he renames him at first sight. And he says, your name will be Peter. So if you, if you look at the Bible, you see that happen different times, especially in the Old Testament, where someone has one name and then they're given a new name. It's, it's a way to mark identity. It's to say, hey, you were this person, but now I'm making you new. So that's Jesus extending to him the invite. Hey, be my disciple. Be my disciple. Now, question for us is, what did discipleship look like back in the first century? I did some research. I'll, I'll read a few things to just paint that picture. You, you served your rabbi as you learned how to follow the word of God like he does. The object of discipleship is to follow, emulate, copy, duplicate, and replicate your rabbi all while serving him. Here's another one. While not overtly required, disciples invariably had a deep desire to emulate their rabbi. This often um, included them imitating their rabbi and how the rabbi ate, observed the Sabbath, what he liked and disliked, his mannerisms, his prejudices, his preferences. Some disciples, there's a story of a disciple even going and following his rabbi into his bedroom to see how he sleeps. He's like, man, I really, really, really want to be like you. So discipleship was pretty extreme back then. Now, what does Jesus say about discipleship? Matthew 16, 24. Jesus says this. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus is saying, if you want to be my follower, in, in other words, my disciple, you must give up your own way, which means whatever your way was, give that up. Take up your cross. What, what is he talking about with cross? Well, Jesus is talking to people in the first century. They understand what the cross meant. The cross meant that you were going to be humiliated. The cross meant that you were going to be dishonored. It was a tactic the Romans used to help, to help shame people for any wrong they had done. And so like back then, you would actually be beaten, you would be naked, and you would carry half of the cross and walk to where they would put you on the other half, the long half of the cross, and you'd be nailed there and be ridiculed. So Jesus is saying, take up that cross. And then he's saying, follow me. So Jesus, Jesus is saying, give up your own way, your own way for success, comfort, any of those things. Give up your fear of experience humiliation, dishonor, misery, and shame. Give up that fear, then follow me. So let's put it to this modern day context. Jesus is saying, be my diehard fan. Y'all might remember any sports fans in here. Not too long ago, the Chiefs played against the Dolphins. This is January 13th, 2024, so not too long ago. And in that game, the temperatures got as low as negative four degrees. Meanwhile, the stadium's filled with people. People, there's at least 12 people recorded having to go to the hospital, University of Kansas hospital, to have toes and fingers amputated. Why? Because they, they're diehard fans. And there's the hospital even said, they said there's more coming. It just, it, it might take a while to sh this, for the symptoms to shorten the body. Why did these people do this? It's because they wanted to see the Chiefs beat the Dolphins 26 to 7. Right? Here's the thing. Jesus wants that kind of diehard discipleship. Where you're willing to pursue him 
regardless of what can happen along the way because you trust him above trusting yourself. So now that I've explained discipleship, you're, you're in like one of four categories. You're maybe at a place where you're like, man, discipleship, I'm all about it. Let's go, Carrie. Jesus did too much for me. Man, I got to follow him. I got, no, I got no other option. Maybe you're at a place where you hear discipleship and you're like, that's a lot. I don't know, man. That's, that's a lot. Or maybe you're at a place where you're like, Carrie, you, 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 know, you basically pulled some stuff from the internet. I got a lot more questions for you. you know? Or maybe you're at a place where you're like, listen, man, the definition you gave, I'm good. I, I don't need to, to follow it or I don't want to follow it. So I want to speak to the people that feel especially uncomfortable or the people um, that feel unsure about discipleship. Let's speak to some concerns that can pop, pop up. So here's some arguments that someone might have against discipleship. So to, to the people sitting in this room, including myself, you might be in a place where you're like, you know what? I don't want to be discipled. Now, I'm going I'm to share some, some of the reasons. No particular order here. But here's one of the reasons you might say, I don't want to be discipled. Well, I think I know enough. I think I'm pretty good. The Holy Spirit's in me. So like, I'm good to go. Maybe that's a reason to not be disciple. Well, this is from Mark Dever's book again. Jesus did not, Jesus died not for separate individuals, but for a church. By adopting you, God brought you into a spiritual family so that now you have brothers and sisters. We demonstrate our family membership and love for him through our love for one another. We do that through our submission to and fellowship with the local church. Next one here. I don't have time for discipleship. I'm too busy for discipleship. Okay? Well, if that's you, if you feel like that, I would ask you, please go back to the drawing board and take time to appreciate Jesus' life, his burial, and his resurrection. Please do that. Maybe you're at a place where you're like, you know what? I'm afraid to be vulnerable. I, I can relate. Sometimes I'm afraid to be vulnerable. Uh, and... To that, here's what I would say. I know it can be scary to at the thought of being vulnerable, but there's actually a lot of freedom that you experience from being vulnerable. There's actually a lot of freedom when you when you realize, man, I don't have to act like I have it all together all the time. Amen. So the people that are like, well, no one can understand what I'm going through, right? First Corinthians 10 13 says. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Discipleship's the way out. That's one of the ways out. Now, let's say you're at a place where you're like, man, listen, can I do this like kind of half in, half out? Is that an option? I would ask you to go back to the drawing board. Look at Jesus' life, burial, and resurrection. Maybe you're at a place where you're like, you know what? I think I'll do it, but like, I think I'll just do like the bare minimum route. If that's you, I'd ask you to go back to the drawing board. Look at Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. Why did Jesus die? What did that accomplish? What does that mean for the whole entire world? I want to speak to the people who... Maybe you're thinking like, well, I don't want to disciple anybody. And you have reasons why you don't want to, right? Maybe you're thinking, I don't want to disciple anyone because I don't know enough, right? That's okay. We're not here to pressure anyone into doing any set thing. As a matter of fact, we can talk through that and we can learn together, right? Now, maybe you're in a position where like, well, I could disciple, but I'm afraid to be vulnerable, well, what I would say to that is there's actually a lot of freedom in being vulnerable. There's a beauty in, in not having to act like you have things all together all the time. If you're in a position where you're like, I could decide for people, but I don't have the time. I would say to that, go back to the drawing board. Look, look at Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. Why did Jesus die? What does that mean? 
He conquered sin, what does that mean? He conquered death, what does that mean? And then maybe you're in a position where you're like, you know what? I got a lot of mess I'm already dealing with, so I don't want to disciple someone and deal with their mess. <laughs> well, Jesus did not die for separate individuals, but for a church. Yes. By adopting you, God brought you into a spiritual family. Being a part of a family means we look out for each other. We, we, we know that. We believe that. So going back to Peter now, Jesus renamed him in John chapter 1. And so the text we're about to read, you see Jesus, Peter did not say, bam, I'm following you. I'm, I'm going to go after you. You're the lamb. You're the one we've been waiting for. That's, you're the one that's been proclaimed about since Genesis 1. Everyone has said the Messiah is going to come and he's going to change everything. I should follow you. He, he, he doesn't. Why? I, the text that we're about to read doesn't specifically tell us. Maybe Peter doesn't understand like discipleship's like a full-time gig. Maybe that. Maybe Peter's thinking like, listen, man, I'm a full-time fisherman, which means he works at night, plus he's married. That means he got a lot of responsibilities, right? You know what I'm saying? Like you probably you need energy during the daytime, which is probably hard for him because he sleeps during the day, so he can work at night. Maybe Peter's afraid to be vulnerable. Maybe Peter has commitment issues. We don't know. But here it is, Mark 1, 16 to 18. So John 1, Jesus renames Peter. You go to Mark 1, 16, 18. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he, meaning Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. So, for whatever reason, there was a disconnect. G P Peter got renamed. He was Simon. He's now called Peter. He didn't follow. Jesus asked him again, hey, leave what you're doing and come and follow me. So, I imagine in this room, there are various feelings towards discipleship, right? Maybe you were in a discipleship relationship and you got hurt by someone they said something or they did something to you. And so now you, you feel like you want to distance yourself from discipleship. Maybe you were in a, a church setting where you saw like a vision cast for discipleship, but then it was like executed poorly. And so that gave you like a distaste for discipleship. Or maybe um, it might be some other reason. Maybe you're like, you know, I, I still don't get what you mean by discipleship. Like in this modern day, Carrie, are you telling me to like, go find a rabbi and like live with him and stay under his bed? No, you know, um, here's the thing. You might have a scar. You might have a wound when it comes to the sky discipleship. And I don't want to discredit that, but here's what I do want to say. Jesus invites us to discipleship. Discipleship is not a church thing. Discipleship is a Jesus thing. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Then John 8 31 and 32, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you, remain, if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So Jesus is inviting us to discipleship. Listen to the words. He says, let me teach you because I am gentle and humble at heart and you will find rest for your souls. I don't see that advertisement anywhere. Jesus only offers that. Jesus says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Oh, man. So, so with, with Jesus' invite in mind of discipleship, what will discipleship look like at Pillar? What, what does it look like for us here today? Well, discipleship here 
We want it to look like what Peter gets to experience in Luke chapter 5. So John chapter 1, Peter's name, uh, excuse me, Simon's name, Peter, but then he doesn't follow. Then you jump to Mark chapter 1, and Jesus says again, hey, follow me. Well, now you jump to Luke 5, and Jesus gives a third invite. So this is Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. I'm going to read it. And like I said before, we want people to experience what Peter gets to experience here. It says, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he, meaning Jesus, was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen gone out of them and were washing their nets. Just a quick side note on that. So fishermen fish at night, so by morning you wash your nets. Verse 3, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out, uh, put out a little from the land. And he saw, excuse me, he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered him, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So in this passage, Peter experiences an overwhelming amount of grace. So picture the scene. Jesus has a crowd pressing in on him. He says to Peter, hey, let me stand in your boat to preach. Why? Because the, the water actually get, helps reverberate his voice louder. So Peter says, yeah, no problem. So meanwhile, Peter's cleaning his nets. Jesus finishes preaching. Jesus says, hey, listen, I actually want you to fish right now. And Peter's like, nah, now is not the time to fish. You fish at night. The kind of nets they had were too thick. Fish can see that in the day. He said, you know what? But since you said so, I'll do it. So he goes, he gets in his boat. He puts the net in the water. And then it says the catch is so large, he has trouble taking it out. The catch is so large, it starts making his boat sink. So he has to call his, his neighboring partners. Hey, I need some help. This is too big of a catch. So they start helping him and their boat starts to sink. What is Jesus doing? Showing grace. See, so now, so, so now Peter, he, he catches this and he's like, yo, this is a miracle. I fished all night and I caught nothing. Now I did the worst tactic in the world at that time and I'm fishing early morning and I catch more than I can handle. So he goes to Jesus and he gets at his knees and he says, please leave me for I am a sinful man. Jesus understands that Jesus has just shown him a grace that is uncomprehendable. Jesus did not condemn Peter. Though, though Peter denied Jesus' request for discipleship twice, Jesus did not treat him wrong. Jesus did not uh, get mean with him. All Jesus asks is, hey, let me use your boat so I can preach. Jesus showed Peter Grace. So what do we want discipleship to look like at Pillar Norfolk? We want it to look like what Peter experienced. We want people to experience God's grace. 
We want people to experience God's grace as we converse with one another. We want people to experience God's grace when we get up early in, in just a few weeks to pray up early in the morning. We want people to experience God's grace there. No one has to have a perfect prayer. You don't have to uh, have a, a, a seminary degree in prayer or anything like that. No, we're going to meet together. We're going to pray because of God's grace. We want when people hear God's word preached that you be hearers and doers of the word because of God's grace. We want people to experience God's grace over and over and over and over. That's what we want experienced here at Pill Norfolk. So now, what is the main means of small group right now um, that we're publicly talking about? It's small groups. So when you come to a small group, we want you to think of it as a place of grace. When you go to, if you go to Jonathan's house Wednesday at 6 p.m., we want you to experience God's grace. If you come to the Martin's home on Thursday night at 6, we want you to experience God's grace. And uh, at, there's one thing that we say the moment that we're starting small group to set the tone, set the culture. We say grace, or excuse me, gospel plus safety plus time plus prayer. We want the gospel to be talked about, which is a spiritual thing. We want that to be talked about in safety, in safety of discussion, in safety to learn, in safety to ask questions, no pressure to anyone. That speaks to time, the time piece. Like there's no, we're not trying to force anyone to get to any set spiritual milestone. We're here together. We want, we want there to be safety in, in being able to ask questions and in, in needing a little bit more time. And we want to do things in prayer because only God can change the heart. No man does that. And we see that. We recognize that. We honor that. We love that. And so with that said, we want it there to be safety, time in these, these, these small groups. Ask questions. If you need to stay after, ask more questions. If you want to talk more, let's do that. Lord willing, in the near future, we want to have what's called discipleship groups or D groups. So a D group is a setting for people. Imagine two to three people that are like, yo, we want to we want to be those diehard fans. We're, we're, we're there. All right. Well, let's do that. Let's let's start studying God's word intensely. Let's start actually checking on each other with tough accountability questions. Let's actually start doing homework that we got to discuss when we come together. Just like just like when I go to my job, you know, and I, and I, 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 I got to do that training report and all that stuff like that. No, I'm going to I'm going to treat my spiritual life the same. That's imagine a discipleship group. It's that same kind of ordeal. Then there's the organic side of discipleship. And we can invite each other into each other's homes, especially considering Norfolk's a transient community. You know, the, the key to your home can actually be a place for God's grace to be shown. Norfolk has a lot of people come in and out, in and out. And what, what does that mean? That means that there's a, a, a strong probability people can feel lonely. And so with the gospel, the, the key that God has given you, you can actually make a great impact for people in this church and people outside of this church. Then there's the influential side of, of discipleship. So with that being said, you can follow the pastors or a mature Christian that you know and, and say, hey, listen, I want to I want to stick around you. I want to I want to I want to be near you. I want to get real close because I want to see how what is it? What's your what's your study rhythm like? What time are you up to pray to the Lord? How how long do you pray? What's your method of prayer? How long do you spend praising God? How long do you spend repenting? What's, what's your posture of prayer? Are you on your knees? Do you get on your face to worship the Lord? Do you read Psalms and sing to the Lord by yourself, worshiping the creator of the word? Do you, do you know Psalm 24 where it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him? What are you doing? Because listen, man, 
I, Jonathan, I see you when you're at work. You seem different. What's that about? Here's the thing. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to elevate any man. I'm not trying to elevate myself. I'm not trying to elevate Jonathan and say we're perfect. But I am saying what 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that also to the mature believer. Doesn't necessarily have to be somebody in this room. You could do something as simple as saying, hey, can I invite you over for dinner? You, you buy them a meal or buy them coffee, something like that. <laughs> and say, hey, can we talk? I got some questions. I want to grow in the Lord. And, and that's organic. You, there doesn't have to be anything formal with that, right? Or you could be like, hey, listen, I know, I know it's the NBA playoffs. How about, can we, can we like watch the game together? And we, we could just chop it up, man. Like, I, I got some questions. You know, we could talk as, as the game progresses. You could do that. And then I mentioned this already, but then there's corporate prayer. I'm going to keep uh, mentioning prayer. Uh, like, man, I know 530 is early. I know that you might be thinking, my mind's not even like in function mode at 530. Unless you're in the military. Military might be different. You know what I'm saying? But for, the, you know, for some people, my mind's not even in function mode at 530. You know what I mean? But here's the thing about God's grace. Just like Peter experienced that grace, we experience that same grace. That's why Psalm 145 verse 9 says, God is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all creation. So like when you get up early in the morning, I'm telling you, 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 you're going to wake up not feeling necessarily like interested or awake, but I'm telling you, you finish that prayer, you're like, mm, mm, let's go. You know what I'm saying? Like you're ready, you, you're just ready to go spiritually, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's just like working out in that sense, right? Like you might try to do your workout and you're like, man, I'm not feeling it. But then next, you know, next thing you know, like the, the endorphins start kicking in your mind, especially not to mention after you're like, wow, I feel so like, so strong <laughs> um, and I feel I feel um, re-energized it's, it's the same thing when it comes to prayer it's the same thing when you go to a small group you might walk into it feeling like you know what man these people might not understand me or they look different from me or they won't understand what I've been through so on and so forth and you know what not everybody will and that's okay but the Lord has placed people in that group that can love on you and speak into your life and walk with you no matter how long you will be in Norfolk or Virginia Beach or Chesapeake or Suffolk, wherever you might be from. So here's the thing. Jesus invites us to discipleship. Discipleship is not a church thing. It's a Jesus thing, which is why in Matthew 11, Jesus says, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden I give you is light. Then I got a John 8, that piece. Jesus says, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle of heart. Excuse me, that's Matthew 11 again. And you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray. Father, um, God, you give a special kind of rest that, God, it's unequivocal. There's nothing like it. And we pray Lord, um, there's there's pieces of us, Lord, that, that buck against it. <clears throat> um, like I did in 2013. And Lord, as we can do in and out of our lives, where it's like, man, Jesus, I don't want to let you in this part of the room yet. Um, it's messy in here. But God, you, you want everything from us. But God, you're gentle. You don't come to take it. You invite us. To, to relationship with you. You invite us to greater depth of relationship with you. Lord, please help us. Lord, help us. There's, we, there's sometimes, Lord, there's, 
we don't even know necessarily what to ask for at times. Lord, help us. You are gentle and you say you're lowly. Lord, help us, Lord, to become more like you through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, no matter where anyone in this room is at on that spiritual spectrum, Lord, whether they're far from you, Lord, and they need to repent and believe, or whether they're in a place where they might feel stagnation, or maybe they're at a place where there's overflow, help us to become more like you by your power. In Jesus' name, amen.